Alright, well if you have a copy of God's Word, I would invite you to open to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 27. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to finish uh, the 17th, 17th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. So if you're with us last week, we saw Christ's uh, glory as the only uh, begotten Son of God, right? We saw Christ's glory as it was revealed in the transfiguration. And we saw how God was pronouncing from, uh, from heaven, from this glory cloud, that Jesus is His Son, that He is well pleased in, that they should, or that we should uh, listen to Him. And then we saw last week as Jesus was coming down the mountain, He told everyone not to tell, or told the disciples not to tell anyone the vision. And then they began to ask about Elijah, and we saw how all of that pointed to Christ as the Son of God, that He is more glorious than all things. He fulfills the law and the prophets. He is the greater Moses. He is the greater Elijah. And so this week, we're going to see the continuation of this section of Scripture, but it's going to be sort of played out in a different scene. And so we're going to be leaving the mountaintop, and we're going to be, as it were, coming back to reality, back down to where the rest of the disciples were. But this week, we're going to see a glimpse into Christ as the omnipotent King. Now, what does it mean when I say omnipotent? Omnipotent means all-powerful, containing or having in himself all power. So Christ is the all-powerful or the omnipotent king. Now there is a stark contrast, as we're going to be reading through this, between these, uh, between these two scenes. The first, right, we see Christ's glory as it is revealed, as he is transfigured. It's as though the veil of flesh is sort of... Uh, partially pulled back, and the disciples get a glory, or get a picture, uh, a glimpse into the glory of the Christ, into his, into his nature. Uh, and then Moses and Elijah show up. Right, we have the Father speaking words from heaven. And then in this scene, we're going to see Jesus in the midst of unbelief and suffering. So if that was the mountaintop, right now we're in the valley. So we were on top of the mountain with Christ's glory being revealed. Right, Moses and Elijah showing up, and then we're going to. Step back to reality with suffering and unbelief. And I think we should probably at least notice. I, I, I'm not saying that Matthew is making a direct uh, correlation here. Of course, these events really happened. But he is recording them in such a way that is connected to Moses and Elijah. And I, I think we should probably at least notice the connection here between what's happening in this passage and what happened in Exodus chapter 32, verses 15 through 20. Remember, Moses is meeting with the Lord on the mountain, and then the people are down in the valley building a golden calf. And you remember how that incident happened. Moses starts heading down the mountain. Joshua says, I hear the, the, the sound of war. And he said, that's not the sound of war. And he shows up to one of the most uh, popular worship services in all of Israel, right? The problem is they're worshiping a golden calf at the bottom. And so Moses descends from the mountain in the midst of God's glory, right? He descends from the mountain straight into faithlessness, and unbelief. And in Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses says that about them. They are a faithless and an unbelieving people. And so Jesus is going to make the same comment. But I think there's a connection back again to Moses in Exodus chapter 32. But I want us to keep these two scenes in tension this morning. I don't want us to forget. So I don't want us to shift gears and say, okay, now we forget about the transfiguration. We forget about the glory of Christ. Now we're on to something else. I want us to hold these two scenes in tension. I want us to remember the transfiguration. I want us to remember the glory of Christ. I want us to remember that He is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. That He is the only begotten of the Son. That He is the second member of the Trinity. And I want to hold that intention with what we're going to see today. And as we progress through it, you'll see why I say that. So, I think as we do this, we'll be reminded of exactly, or not exactly, but what Christ had to endure. We'll never know uh, exactly what Christ endured during the Incarnation because we are human. But we'll get a glimpse at, or we'll be reminded of at least, of, of some of the things that Christ had to endure during His incarnation. But I also want us to see the omnipotence or the power of Christ in these verses as the King of creation. The King of creation. Remember from the outset, Matthew's point in his gospel is to show that Jesus is the King. Jesus is the King, that He is the Son of David, that He is the Son of Abraham. He is 
the king that inaugurated the kingdom of God. That unless you are connected to him, the king, you are not part of the kingdom. And he's continuing that motif as we run through this section as well. So let's read this section together and then we will begin to walk through it. Matthew 17, beginning in verse 14. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him, kneeling and kneeling before him, and said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move here, from here to there, and it will be, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. And when they came to Capernaum, the, the, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? And he said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Let's go to the Lord and ask his blessing on his word this morning. Our Father in heaven, God, we come to you this morning with our Bibles open. And Father, we pray that you would prepare our hearts and minds to behold wondrous things from your law. Father, this morning we acknowledge that your word is living and active, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, we know that your word does not return void, that your word accomplishes that exactly for which you send it forth to do. And Father, we know that your word never fades, that the grass of the field and the flowers fade, but your word endures forever. Father, we know that your word is truth. And Father, we pray that you will sanctify us in the truth. Father, we also acknowledge that your word can only be understood through the spirit because spiritual things are spiritually discerned and the flesh is no help at all. And so, Father, this morning we pray that you will make us what we are not yet. Father, that you will shape us into the image of Christ, that like clay in your hands you will mold us and make us. Father, transform us by the renewing of our minds according to your word and the power of your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the first thing that I want us to see in this passage is the omnipotent king who has authority over Satan. The omnipotent king who has authority over Satan. Now, this is something that we've seen throughout the Gospel of Matthew, all the way from the time of the, of the temptation in the wilderness of Matthew 4, all the way up until now. We have seen that Jesus has sovereign authority over demons, over the power of darkness, and over Satan himself. Indeed, whenever he speaks of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, he tells them, at least in an implicit way, that he has bound the strong man and that he is taking captives from the kingdom of darkness. And so we understand and we see that Jesus is the omnipotent, the all-powerful king who has authority over Satan. So what happens? Well, Jesus comes down the mountain in verse 9. So he's coming down the mountain, and whenever they come down the mountain, they come to a crowd. And there is a man who comes up to Jesus and asks for Jesus to have mercy on his son. And the reason is, is because his son suffers seizures. He is demon-oppressed. He is literal translation. He's a, a lunatic. He is these types of actions that are happening that are abnormal for someone to have. And so he knows that his son is suffering terribly falling into the fire, into the water, and so he sought out the disciples, and the disciples were powerless to help him. So he comes and he asks Jesus for help. So the disciples can't do it, or at least they can't do it the way they've been trying. But can you imagine the frustration, the feeling of frustration and hopelessness that the Father must be experiencing? 
This is his son. This is the one that he loves. This is his son. And his son is suffering terribly under the oppression of the kingdom of darkness. Under a terrible disease. And the disciples whom he thought he could come to to get help, they can't help. And so he runs to Jesus, which is exactly what we all should do, is it not? We should go to Jesus, you see, because only Jesus has the authority to do what Jesus can do. No mere man can save you. I hope you understand that. No mere man can offer you the things that Christ can because Christ is no mere man. Yes, He is a man, truly human. But as we saw last week, He is also truly God. Remember the transfiguration. We saw the glory of Christ, the glory of the only Son. We see the glory of Christ as He is revealed in His, in his divinity, at least in partiality. So this man goes to the source. He goes to Jesus. So then what does Jesus do? Does Jesus come and does he struggle with the demon for a while? Does he do all of these things that you might see on a TV show to get the demon to come out? He certainly does not. Jesus says, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. Then look what, Jesus, look what Matthew says in verse 18. Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of him. The boy was healed instantly. You see that? Jesus rebuked the demon. The demon came out. And the boy was healed instantly. There's no arguing from Jesus. There's no resistance that is coming from the demon that we are told of. There's no, there's no bargaining that happens, right? There's no uh, pleading with the demon. If he'll do this, then Jesus will do this. It's simply a rebuke from the Son of God. The demon leaves. The disease is immediately healed. And the demon does exactly what he tells him to do. Never forget, brothers and sisters, that we don't live in a yin and yang universe where God is in this cosmic battle with His co-equal Satan. This is not the picture that we have from any parts of any part of the Bible. No book of the Bible would elevate Satan in that way. Remember that God is the creator and sustainer of all that is and all that ever will be. As Paul says in Acts 17, in Him we live, move, and have our being. Satan is a created being. He's created just like the rest of the angels. There is no equality between God the Father or God the Son or God the Holy Spirit and Satan as though Satan has any leverage or authority over God. As Martin Luther would say, Satan is God's Satan. Satan only does what God allows him to do. And one day God will deal with Satan catastrophically. And there will be no bargaining or arguing. There will be no pleading for mercy in that day. See here, see here the glory of the King, the glory of the omnipotent King as He rebukes the demon, casts him out, heals the boy instantly. I think we have here a glimpse of what it will be like in the Kingdom of God when we experience in its fullness whenever Christ returns. No disease, no sickness, no Satan, no dealing with all of the issues and the problems and the sorrows that we experience in this life. But what happened to the disciples? Well, Jesus rebukes them. He rebukes them and the entire generation, probably quoting from Deuteronomy 32, making a correlation between the people of God in the time of Deuteronomy and the people of God in the first century. Faithless and crooked or twisted generation. How long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Now keep those two sentences in mind whenever we get to the, get to the end of this section. Just keep those in your mind, what Jesus is saying there. Bring him here to me. What does he say? The disciples come to him in verse 19, and they ask Jesus privately and said, Why? Why could we not cast it out? Why did we fail? What does he say? Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you had faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And then some translations add prayer and fasting here. Now, the reason why it's not in my copy is because prayer and fasting, at least in Matthew's Gospel, is not in the best manuscripts that we have, the best or the oldest manuscripts in, that we have. But Mark's Gospel tells us in Mark chapter 9, verse 29, that Jesus indeed said prayer, and He more than likely also added fasting as well. So we'll just look at those in order. Lack of faith. Now, what does Jesus mean by lack of faith? 
Because many word faith healers will say this is a clear instance of where they did not have enough faith to muster up to be able to do a miracle in God's name. But I don't think that's what Jesus means. Jesus is not saying that they had the right kind of faith, just a little bit of it, because he says that the right kind of faith, even a little bit of it the size of a mustard seed, will move a mountain. So that can't be what he's saying. I, probably, I think he probably means poor faith. I think they were placing their faith in the wrong object. So then what were they placing their faith in? Well, I think that they were placing them faith, their faith in themselves. Now I'll tell you why. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 15, Jesus had already given them the authority to cast out demons and to heal sickness. In Luke chapter 10, verse 17, we see that they actually rejoiced that the kingdom of darkness had to obey them in Christ's name, or that the kingdom of darkness, the demons did what they asked in Christ's name. In Christ's name, rather. So they should have been able to do this. But something had changed. Something in the where they were placing their faith, something about their object of faith, their connection to prayer and fasting, something had changed in their minds. What do I think it is? I think that if their problem was a lack of faith in God and prayer, which Jesus says, then perhaps I think that they had begun to think of their ability as something that they possessed. Sort of like a magic trick that they had the authority to do at any time. Their faith had turned from God to themselves, and evidently they hadn't prayed about it at all. If Jesus has to tell them that this kind only comes out by prayer, and that their faith was lacking, it means they had a lack of faith, and that they weren't praying about it. But don't we do the same thing? You can see it even in the history of the church, can't you? You'll see a real revival, where the Holy Spirit moves... And people are saved, lives are sanctified, people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, people are broken in their sin, they are repenting before the Lord God, they are falling on their faces before the Almighty. That's a real revival. And then today we see counterfeit revivals all over the country, where God is not glorified, Jesus is not exalted, and the Father is not present. What's the difference? Well, we begin to think that if we follow a certain protocol, if we do a certain program, if we do the right thing, if we just do what we did last time, then somehow we will be able to conjure up the authority and the power of God. And what we forget is we never possess the authority and the power of God aside from Jesus Christ. You see, everything that we try to accomplish in this life for the kingdom is only possible if God accomplishes it through us. That's why we pray, isn't it? That's why we fast. That's why we seek the Lord. That's why we do all things in the power of God. That's why we attempt our best to follow God's will. Because if God does not will it to happen, no matter how many steps we take, no matter how many programs we can cop, the kingdom of God will not be moved. you understand? Only Christ, only Christ had authority in this story over Satan. Disciples have none outside of the authority of Christ. So Christ had already given them the ability, He had already given them the authority in His name to do this. But they had probably, I believe, turned to a different way. A more programmatic way. So then what does Jesus tell them? You had poor faith, you had little faith. Because I tell you that if you had uh, even a little bit of right faith, that means faith placed in the right object, by the way, faith in God, if you had just a little bit of that, the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will, be, it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, what does Jesus say here? Because what do we, what do, we do with that? Nothing will be impossible for you if we have faith. Well, some will say, if you just have enough faith, then all things are possible. You will be healed of all diseases. You will be wealthy beyond your riches. I mean, your imagination, your richest imaginations. But is that really what this means? Can all of us who have true saving faith in Christ, can we go and stand before Texas children and command all of these diseases to leave these children? We can't. Otherwise, we would. You understand that this has to be balanced here. This has to be 
balanced by what we have already seen throughout the gospel. You need to understand that nothing is impossible. It has to be balanced with the thought that nothing is impossible if God commands it, if God wills it, and if God empowers it. Listen, Christian, let me say to you a lot of heartache in your prayer life. If God does not will for that to happen, then no amount of faith on your part is going to cause it to happen. Listen, only God can do it, and God sees the ramifications of our actions in a way that we could never imagine. You understand that when we're praying to God, we see maybe one or two consequences, three or four consequences at the most of the thing that we are asking for. God sees trillions. Trillions. And one day, God's not going to heal your body, no matter how much faith you have. One day, you're going to get sick and you're going to die, no matter how much faith you have. That's why Jesus came. He came so that way whenever we die, we will live. That though we die, we will live. That's what he says in John chapter 11. He is the way, the truth, and the life, right? We understand that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, right? Jesus is the way. John 14, Jesus is the way. He's the truth and the life. John 11, he is the resurrection and the life. He contains life, and in him was life, and the life was the life of men. Only God has the power to do this. It's not about faith in this healing sense. It's not about faith in this prosperity sense. It's about faith to trust God. They should have been trusting God. Nothing will be impossible if God wills it, commands it, or empowers it. But if God does not will it, no amount of faith will make it happen. And remember, Christian, it's not the amount of faith that one has. Mustard seed size faith, that's what Jesus is talking about. It's the object of one's faith. A little bit of faith in an omnipotent God will go a long way. But a whole lot of faith in anything else won't accomplish anything. And this is exactly what Jesus is trying to tell here. Jesus is the omnipotent King who has all authority over sickness and over Satan. The second thing that we see is that Jesus is the omnipotent King who came to die. Look in verses 22 through 23. We won't spend much time on this because we've already covered it a few weeks ago. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Again, don't lose the tension between the transfiguration and in this passage, again, Jesus is telling his disciples that he came to die. That he came to die. Remember the transfiguration. Remember the glory of Christ as the flesh is pulled back in a partial way and the disciples see his glory as his face is shining from the sun. Not a reflected glory like that of Moses on the mountain, but a, a glory from within him, a glory that belonged to him as it is radiating from his face. As we are seeing Moses and Elijah talking about his soon exodus as he is the second member of the Trinity. He came to die. To be delivered into the hands of men, to die, and to be raised on the third day. I will point to one thing. Look how he says it, to be delivered into the hands of men. This could be a pointing to the betrayal of Jesus by Judas. It will be delivered by Judas to the hands of men who will kill him. But never forget that the omnipotent king stepped out of glory for the sole purpose of death. He lived the life that you never could, and he died the death that you deserved. He bore God's wrath in your place so that you could live eternally. Put another way, the Son of God became man so that men could become sons of God. And this is exactly what he's telling the disciples. The third thing that we see is the omnipotent King who sets aside his glory. The omnipotent king who sets aside his glory. Look at verses 24 through 27. And I want this scene to really loom large in your mind. Imagine that you are there that day. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the true drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? And he said, Yes. Now that's kind of ambiguous, isn't it? 
Yes, he does. Or yes, he doesn't. Yes, he does pay the tax. Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, yes. And then when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him. You see this? Peter didn't even get a chance to come in and ask Jesus. And Jesus asks Peter a question. Again, speaking to Jesus' omniscience. What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give defense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. When you open his mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Now before we dive into this, I want us to say one important word about the divinity of Christ. We need to understand, listen Christian, Christ did not give up his divinity when he came to the earth. Let me say that again and I want you to hear this and I want you to put it down big, plain and straight in your mind as Adrian Rogers would say. Christ never gave up his divinity. His divinity never changed. It never changes. God is immutable. God does not change. Jesus is God. What the Father is in essence, so is the Son. What the Son is in essence, so is the Holy Spirit. They are co-equal. They are of the same essence. We believe in one God that eternally exists in three persons. Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, never gave up His divinity. When He came to this earth, He was divine. Christ is always the second member of the Trinity. He is always divine. He was then, He is now, and He will forever be divine. Think about it this way. If God ever ceased to be God in His triunity, in the same way that He has always been God from before the foundation of the world, then there was a fundamental change in the being of God, which is something that the Scripture unapologetically denounces. Jesus never gave up His divinity while He was on the earth. And that's one of the reasons why the Incarnation is so shocking. But what did He do? So what did He give up? Well, what He did do is He set aside His glory, the glory of His divinity. He chose to experience His life on this earth as men do. He took on flesh. He was born under the law to redeem those under the law in Galatians 4.4. 4. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. For Paul means held on to tightly, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So don't ever think that Jesus lost his divinity. He took on flesh and he set aside the glory of his divinity while he was on the earth. But Jesus was still truly God. And he still is truly God today. So what are the two drachma tax? Well, the two drachma tax, tax is one that has its genesis in Exodus 30 verses 11 through 16, but it is sort of changed a bit, right? Of course, as everything had evolved through the oral tradition with the Pharisees and the scribes, with the Sadducees, with the religious leaders, as they had sort of expanded and added on to it, it sort of morphed into what we see in this passage today. So they come to Peter, not Jesus. Perhaps it was, they thought it was rude to go to the, to the source, or maybe they want to interrupt him, whatever the case may be. They go to Peter, probably as the leader of the group, who wasn't Jesus, right? But what is Jesus's response. Look at this. What do you think, Simon? What do you think, Simon? It's funny to me that Jesus initiates this conversation with a question for Peter. Peter probably wanted to rush in and say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? But he asks him a question. So, Simon, what do you think? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? Now, at this point, with Peter having already stuck his foot in the mouth, foot right in mouth with the whole you're not going to die Jesus far be it from you forbid it forbid it Jesus and Jesus calling him Satan I would be just a little bit leery about answering any more questions but Peter seems to find himself able to answer this question so he says from others so then Jesus said and the sons are free don't miss what Jesus is saying here so 
He's asking Peter, do the earthly kings, do they, do they go into their own homes? Do they tax their sons, their children? Do they, do they walk in their bedrooms and say, hey, thank you for being my son. Hey, I'm going to need some tax from you. No, they don't. Who do they tax? They tax people outside of their own household. Their people, they tax those who are uh, people who are living in their country or their nation under their rule and authority. But they don't, they don't tax the sons. They don't tax their family. Now, why is Jesus saying this? What is Jesus' point? Well, the basic point is not that hard to understand. God is king. This is his temple. Jesus is his son. So technically, Jesus should be free from having to pay the tax. And he's the second member of the Trinity. One of the ones whom they are worshiping in the temple. They worship one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall worship no other gods before me. They are worshiping the triune God of the universe. And then what do they say? They come to him and say, you need to pay the temple tax. How ironic is that? That God came to the earth and they tried to tax him for the temple. So Jesus asked, do the kings of the earth, do they do this? Well, the answer is surely no. And if God is king, and God has literally just said in verse 5, this is my beloved son, Jesus is God's son, that Jesus should have been should have been able to get out of the tax, of course. He's not subject to the tax, especially the way that they're holding the tax. And by extension, the sons are free. By extension, we are connected to Christ, which is a whole other story here. But he says, however, not to give offense to them. Keep in mind the transfiguration. Keep in mind that he was just proclaimed as the Son of God. But think about one other thing. As soon as Jesus dies, the temple is obsolete. You realize that, right? Like as soon as Jesus dies and the sacrifice is once for all made, the temple is no more. The curtain rips in two. The temple is totally obsolete. The temple means absolutely nothing because Jesus is the sacrifice that all of the other sacrifices pointed to. He is the presence of God that the temple of God pointed to. He made the final sacrifice that brought peace between God and man. And now God dwells in His people, not in a temple. So as soon as Jesus dies, the temple is obsolete anyway. And that's a point the Jews couldn't get. And God completely destroyed the temple in 70 AD. But what does Jesus do? Does He tell them that? I'm the Son of God. And I am about to completely make your temple obsolete as soon as you kill me. He doesn't do that. He decides to pay the tax so as not to give any unnecessary offense. That's what he says in verse 27. However, not to give offense to them, we're going to pay. Now think about how Jesus here exemplifies the command to love your neighbor as yourself. This is exactly what Paul would later speak of causing your brother to stumble by the things that you eat or the days that you keep or trying to bind someone's conscience. Jesus is fulfilling this. So notice that even in Jesus where there is necessity, Jesus will confront with bold abandon. He's been doing that throughout the gospel, but where it really doesn't matter, he doesn't cause unnecessary offense. So remember that Jesus took on flesh so that you could be saved. Think about, think about all of the things that Jesus endured in the Incarnation. On the mountain, transfigured, before his disciples, glory shining, the Father pronouncing from heaven, comes down from the mountain, encounters a faithless, twisted generation that tries to tax the king in his own temple, or for his own temple. Think about that when you think about the Incarnation. Think about stepping out of the glories of heaven and into this mess. The death, the suffering, the demon oppression of the first century where this boy is thrown into fire and into water. Think about all of these things. And then think about the reason. Why did Christ take on flesh? Well, it was to glorify God first and foremost through our salvation. But the secondary reason is for you. Jesus took on flesh so that you could be saved. 
The omnipotent king took on flesh so that you could be saved. And he stepped into this. The fourth thing that we see is the omnipotent king who has authority over all creation. And this is, I don't know why, this is one of my favorite little miracles that Jesus does. It's not a little miracle. If you've ever fished at all, you know this is not a little miracle. So what does Jesus tell Peter to do? He says, go and cast a hook. Usually it's nets, right? But Jesus singles it out. Go and cast a hook. And the first, notice that first, number one, the first fish that he catches will have a shekel in it. Now think about everything that had to happen for this miracle to be fulfilled. I mean, I just want you to really think about it because I think that we read over it and we just think, okay, yeah, so Peter went and caught a fish and there was a shekel in it. Listen, I can't even command the fish to bite whenever I'm fishing, let alone have a shekel in their mouth. Think about all of the things that happened to make this miracle come to pass. First of all, someone, whoever it is, in God's providence, had to drop a shekel in the water somewhere. Right? So wherever this fish is, the fish, the fish that Peter caught out of every fish in the sea, the fish that Peter was going to catch, took the shekel in his mouth, but didn't swallow it. So it's hanging out in his mouth. Then Peter had to go to the exact right place on the sea to go fishing. The exact right spot to fish. Then... At the exact right moment, Peter had to throw a line into the exact right spot without backlash. He had to be able to reel it in. <laughs> the thing about this, the fish, this fish, this fish, had to be the first one that bit the hook with a shekel in its mouth out of all of the fish of the sea. All of the fish of the sea. And then Peter had to land the fish and then remove the shekel from its mouth. Do you see this? So shekel falling out of pocket in the sea, fish swims up, takes the shekel in its mouth, Peter goes to the exact right spot, casts at the exact right moment, the exact right fish with a shekel in its mouth, bites on Peter's hook, Peter reels it in or brings it in, opens the fish's mouth, takes the shekel out. All of that to get a shekel. To pay the two drachma tax for two people. Like this is the omnipotent king of all creation. Like let me tell you, there are a lot, a lot easier ways to get a shekel in the first century. But Jesus is revealing, even in his humility, even as he is humbling himself in the form of man, that he is the God of creation. You see, this is not an issue. If you are the one who spoke and everything left into existence, if you are the creator and the sustainer of all that is and all that ever will be, if you know where every single fish is in the sea, if you know every star by name and every hair on someone's head, don't you see, this is no problem at all. But for us, it's impossible. I wonder what Peter thought. Peter's a fisherman. What would you think? Maybe Jesus taught him exactly where to go and how to stand and how to put his mouth and what to put on the hook and where to cast it and at what time. I don't know. But Matthew just tells us that he said, go ahead, Peter. Just go get you a fishing hook and some line. Go throw it into the sea and the fish you catch, just go ahead and get the shackle. Like, like it's no big deal. Like it's not a problem. And just take the shackle out of his mouth and you just go pay the tax. It's not that big of a deal, Peter. Like this is God of creation. God of creation. Even as Jesus is willingly humbling himself to pay the tax, the tax on the temple, he still reveals that he is the sovereign creator and sustainer of everything that is and ever will be. So let me try to sum this up in a package that we can understand here. Matthew is telling us that Jesus is the omnipotent king who has authority over Satan, sickness, and creation. Who set aside his glory that they just saw on the mountain. That set aside his glory to come and die so that you could be saved from your sins and the coming wrath of God. Let me ask you this morning. Have you placed your faith in this king? Do you know this king? I mean, let's, let's scrape off all of the religiosity, all of the pretenses like... 
Ask yourself honestly, do you know King Jesus? Is He the Lord of your life? Has He made you a new creation? Does He hold your eternity in His hand? Are you clothed in His righteousness? Are you sure that if you were to die today and stand before the King that tells fish to eat shekels, that He would say, Come in. Come into the place that has been prepared for you by my Father. Are you sure? Because Jesus says there will be many who come to Him in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name? Lord, did we not do mighty works and cast out demons in Your name? And Jesus will say to them, Depart from Me. I never knew You, you workers of lawlessness. You see, faith in anything else has no power to save. Faith in yourself, faith in your abilities, faith in your religion, faith in your ability to keep the moral commands of the Bible has no power to save. Has no more power to save than the disciples had power to cast out this demon. You see, but a little bit of faith, a little bit of faith, a mustard seed sized faith in the true and living God has the power to save you for all of eternity. Like, have you trusted in King Jesus? Wherever you are today, I, I want us to take this time, this few moments that we have left together. I want us to go before the Lord in prayer. But I want to, I want to speak to you and I want to say, if you don't know King Jesus today as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you, I want to urge you to turn away from your sins and yourself to save you. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and call out for salvation because only this King has the authority and the power to save your soul. So if you don't know King Jesus, won't you call out for salvation today? Listen, if that's you and you're unsure about what that means, come and talk to me. I would love to talk to you about what it means to be a follower of Christ. If you are a follower of Christ, remember the transfiguration and think about the scene that we just witnessed in the Bible. And think about all that God did as Christ the Son took on flesh, as Jesus, the second member of the Trinity, as the Son of God took on flesh, lived amidst a faithless, twisted, and corrupt generation, was taxed by the people for His own temple, for the sole purpose of glorifying God and saving your soul. Think about stepping out of the glories of heaven and into this mess. That's love. God loved us. God loves us. He sent His Son so that we never have to die. If you're a Christian here today, I want us to reflect on the goodness, on the love of God. And I want us to see the omnipotent King reigning today. In the midst of craziness, in the midst of things that are out of our control, won't you see the king who can tell a fish to eat a shekel and to bring it to Peter's hood? There is nothing that happens outside of the sovereign hand of God. Won't you keep your faith, won't you keep your eyes focused on the omnipotent king? Let's go to the Lord this morning in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this morning humbly acknowledging that you are the sovereign God of the universe. That there is no God before you, that you are the true and living God, that all other gods are false gods, they are, they are mute gods, they are gods that have no power to save, that you are the only Savior of your people. Father, as we are reminded of all of the things that Christ gave up as He stepped out of heaven. Father, never allow us to forget that You too gave Your Son. The Son that You love. The eternal Son of God, eternally begotten by You. That You allowed Him to be crucified. And that You plunged the knife of Your wrath into His chest. That you crushed him for our iniquity so that we might be saved from your wrath. Father, help us to remember that he is our propitiation. That our justification 
is found in Him. And our righteousness is a righteousness that is given, imputed to us. Father, help us to keep our faith placed solely on the Son of God, placed solely on You. Father, empower us to remain faithful. God, help us to keep our eyes on the omnipotent King of all creation. Father, this morning I pray for anyone that doesn't know You. I pray that today for them might be the day of salvation, that they may turn from their sins, and that they may turn in repentance and faith and be saved. Father, we pray that you would not allow us to hear your word and then walk away and forget what we heard. Like a man who would see his reflection and walk away and forget what he looks like. Father, help us to be like the wise man who hears the words and does them. Like a man who builds his house upon the rock. Father, we are clay in your hands. Mold us and make us. Transform us by the renewing of our minds, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.